take the blue pill, the story ends. You wake up in your bed and believe whatever you want to believe. You take the red pill, you stay in Wonderland. And I show you how deep the rabbit hole goes. Upgrades. Well, the new Matrix film has just come out recently, a reboot that we never knew we needed, and one that nobody really asked for. And out of all the movies that came out this year, that was definitely one of them. But it kind of got me thinking about a video I did a few years back for Enter the Matrix, which is one of the few games based off the series that we've ever had. Which then in turn led me to reflect back on Path of Neo, another Matrix video game developed by Shiny and released way back in 2005. Not content with making one crappy Matrix game, Shiny thought they'd set out and make a second one, again with the heavy involvement of the Wachowskis. Though, unlike Enter the Matrix, which was a bit of a side piece to the second film, Path of Neo instead lets the player take on the role of the eponymous protagonist, playing through scenes from the films along with taking a few creative liberties along the way, which we'll get into soon enough. Enter the Matrix was a sloppy, rushed and downright unfinished game with the unfortunate responsibility of having to come out around the same time as that second film to capitalise on the popularity of the series. But it was also unique because the events in the game coincided with what was happening in the movie. It wasn't necessary to play through, but it did help to flesh out the story. And it's a great example of transmedia storytelling done well. Is that right? Path of Neo, on the other hand, didn't have any kind of accompanying film to worry about. Plus, it came out well after the third film in 2005, at a point when most people probably didn't even care about the franchise anymore. And yet, it also still at times feels sloppy, rushed, and just downright unfinished. Show me. Now look, I do think there's a good game in there, somewhere. But then there are moments in this thing that I genuinely cannot believe made it into something that got sold as a finished product. Someone must have signed off on some of the things that made their way into this game, and it just boggles my mind. My mind is boggled. But to review this game, you've got to let the whole thing go. Fear, doubt, disbelief. So let's jack in and jack off, take that red pill and see what this whole thing's about, shall we? Now, at its core, this is pretty much just a beat-em-up, first and foremost, just with a bit of shooting on the side. And I do have to say that, at times, the combat in this thing is incredibly satisfying. You start off as Babe in the Woods Thomas Anderson, fighting lowly police officers in SWAT, but by the end of the game, you'll be taking on upgraded agents, even two or three at a time, and beating the crap out of swarms of Agent Smiths, picking these guys up off the ground and swinging them around like pieces of salami. The most fun I ever had in this game was going back and replaying a lot of those older levels against the agents and just playing them over and over to mess around with the combos because when the whole thing comes together and you're pulling off these lengthy button inputs, the power fantasy level this thing reaches is one of the best I've ever experienced. But that is gatekeeped by a whole lot of crappy content in between and just some downright janky and glitchy controls. These are issues that were prevalent in Enter the Matrix and they haven't really been rectified in Path of Neo either. Now, I first started replaying through this on the PC, and it didn't take very long before I started to realize that that probably isn't the best platform to be doing it on. Even though on the PC it runs at a high resolution, I think in some ways it's actually a worse looking version of the game. And it lacks a lot of visual effects from the Xbox, which is the one that I ended up going with. Like in one of the tutorial levels, for instance, right? The Xbox version's got this pretty good looking mist effect on the ground inside this cave, but then on the PC it just lacks that effect entirely. Clothes on some of the characters also lack subtle effects, making the materials look flat and featureless. Whereas again, on the consoles, they're a lot more visually interesting. 
There's no depth of field effect either, even though half the time that effect isn't calculated properly, making things just look out of focus. But still, the removal of this effect kind of makes the game look less cinematic. More than that though, just the controls. I mean, I think the PC version is way wonkier with a mouse and a keyboard versus playing it with a controller, which honestly is the patrician choice for beat-em-ups. When it comes to the shooting, the console version's got a handy lock-on system, whereas the PC has free aim. But with this thing, that's a bit of a catch-22. Because although that lock-on's kinda handy sometimes, for a lot of the other times, it's just downright broken. And it's not even gonna target someone who's standing right in front of you. Worse than that is how it continues to stay locked onto someone after they're dead, like it's gonna literally lock onto a corpse. It's just a bit of a mess, and that visual diarrhea of having a bunch of those bullet trails flying across the screen really is the stuff that migraines are made of. But it's the hand-to-hand -hand combat where this thing really shines. Combat's broken down into either normal attacks, which are punches and kicks, or a special attack which stuns enemies, leaving them open to the vast amount of combos on offer. And this is where it starts to get deeper than your mum's nether regions. I mean, just as an example, right? You can launch people up into the air, you can machine gun kick or punch them in the chest, or you can pull off devastating cinematic takedowns where you introduce their face to your boot or fist. At the end of most levels, you're able to put an upgrade point into a new ability for Leo. Leo. At the end of most levels, you're able to put a new point into a new ability for Neo. Things like being able to throw someone up into the air and then slam them back down into the ground. Or charging up in midair and then homing in on multiple enemies. And then you can even upgrade these further throughout the campaign too. If you're surrounded by enemies, there's the ability to chain attacks between two or even three at once. And if someone's being an asshole and shooting at you, you can even strip their weapon and use it right back at them. It's actually a really impressive roster of combos and moves, and some of them look absolutely devastating. I think my favorite's that one where you punch someone a bunch of times in the chest, then launch them up into the air, keep on punching before finishing them off with a goddamn shuriken. shuriken! There's apparently like this ultimate combo aptly named The One, which requires a couple of dozen inputs. Now, I've never been able to pull this one off, but I will say though, that feeling of coming close and watching this drawn out sequence fall into place is pretty damn awesome. The only issue is that the better combos can only be pulled off if your focus meter is full, and the main way to fill this thing up again is by just landing normal hits or by finding focus pickups. And then for some reason, your health regenerates automatically, but your focus doesn't, when I mean really, it should have been the other way around. Still though, this hand-to-hand -hand stuff is about as good as the game gets, which I think is in direct contrast to how they've also managed to make some of the worst possible creative choices when it comes to the campaign. Seeing the scenes from the movie recreated in-game is definitely entertaining, and half the time it's done so poorly that it's almost endearing. But these bits aren't the issue. It's when the game tries to do something new where it often seems to suffer. I hope you're right, Captain. You see, Path of Neo just isn't a direct adaptation of the movies. I mean, it loosely follows the plot in that, but it also tries to do its own thing. I mean, even from that opening level. Right, so after an incredibly disjointed cinematic, the first level begins with Neo having to escape that office building as the agents are trying to find and arrest him. This was a fairly quick scene in the movie, I mean it was really just supposed to show that Neo was still very much locked into the system and following the rules of the Matrix. He probably could have gotten away had he left his comfort zone and made that dangerous traversal across the ledge to that window washer's lift, but instead, he did what most people would have done and just let himself get caught. This whole sequence in the game, though, instead shows what might have happened if he had have escaped, and it takes what was barely a 5 minute sequence in the movie and turns it into a 15 minute long one. So, not only do you climb out on that window ledge, but now you're shimmying along the side of the building like it's a Prince of Persia game. Getting into shoving matches with teleporting security guards, all of whom are nice enough to wait their turn before trying to grab you. Before a final on-foot chase through the building as you escape with Trinity on a motorbike. 
After this, you take the red pill and Morpheus shows you how deep his rabbit hole goes, yada, yada, yada. And then you're subjected to what might be one of the longest tutorials of all time. And honestly, I think one of the worst. Is this better? What they've basically done here is expand upon that one scene when Neo's learning all of these new martial arts styles, drunken boxing, taekwondo, and jiu-jitsu. I'm going to learn jiu-jitsu. Only, instead of it just being this montage of him in the chair having tank up loading everything, they've now gone ahead and made levels for each fighting style specifically. It's a series of different levels that are supposed to train you in how combat works, mostly hand-to-hand, -hand, but then also melee weapons like swords. And this is going to teach me kung fu. But it really just feels like a bit of a weird way for the developers to sneak in references to other films. I mean, for the first one, you're sneaking around an underground cave complex taking out bad guys, which is an obvious reference to Enter the Dragon. It's a completely challengeless series of encounters against these brain-dead enemies, followed by a boss fight that's probably going to beat the absolute piss out of you. Because at this point, they haven't even told you how the evade button works. After that, you're in a forest area fighting a similar looking enemy with a sword. And this thing goes on even longer, with Trinity showing up at some point to help you out. Trinity? What are you doing here? Exercise. Following that, there's another sequence, this time in some sort of Japanese pagoda with a black and white film grain filter, which, I don't know, I guess is meant to emulate Akira Kurosawa films or something. Now you're following some kind of samurai ghost, being taught the basics of war running, along with the mechanic of how to attack multiple enemies at once. And this goes on for another 5 to 10 minutes, ending with you having to fight a few different waves of enemies. Oh, but guess what? We're still not done because there's another tutorial after this. This time inside a Chinese tea house where we're fighting droves of axe-wielding enemies being taught how a staff works. And this might be the most useless one of all because, as far as I can remember, you don't even fight guys with axes for the rest of the entire game. I don't even think it's right up until near the end of the campaign that you come across guys using melee weapons at all. And that's kind of my biggest issue here because all of this stuff you've just been force fed for the better part of an hour, you're not going to even be using until well into the story, around 6 or 7 hours later. It's like me asking someone to remember a number from 1 to 10, then coming back a day later and asking them what the number was after they've just had a lobotomy. What you just said is one of the most insanely idiotic things I have ever heard. And imagine my surprise, right, when there's yet another tutorial level after this. Yeah, that's right, we're still not done because now the game's going to teach us how to use firearms. This whole level at least kind of had the right idea, though. It's a reference to that awesome tea house shootout from John Woo's Heart Boiled, one of the best gun fu films of all time, and no doubt a movie and a director that was a huge influence on the Wachowskis. The only problem is that this level is just absolutely dreadful and it kind of showcases just how horrendous the gunplay is. Just really made me want to go and take a shower and replay through Max Payne. So, not only is every weapon so inaccurate unless you're using focus mode, but even when you are using focus mode and shooting at someone, the feedback is so piss poor that you can't even really tell if you're hitting someone. About the only thing I like with the gunplay here is how if you get in nice and close to someone when your guns are out, you can kick them up into the air like a soccer ball and then keep firing. Or grab them by their hind legs and then slam them into the ground like a sack of potatoes. Fuck you! Finally, after this gauntlet of tutorials is done and dusted, you're in that dojo for the fight against Morpheus, one of the best scenes from the first movie. And all I could think of when I finally got to this scene was, why wasn't this the entire tutorial? I mean, they could have easily condensed all those other levels into this one sequence. I mean, if you think about it, that whole scene was basically a tutorial for Neo in the context of the movie anyway. How did I beat you? This could have been a 5 to 10 minute long level where you have to pull off each of the basic combos to progress to the next part of the fight. That way you'd be forced to learn each of the basic moves one by one. Then throughout the rest of the game, you'd get these incremental upgrades and new moves along the way, which is what they've gone and done, only they prefaced it with this incredibly boring and drawn out prologue. I was actually speaking to a mate of mine about this game, and he told me that he never even bothered to finish this because of those first few levels. And you know what? I wouldn't blame anyone for having the same reaction. Honestly, it's just a perfect example of how to not introduce a player to the mechanics of the game. You know, along with starting a game set in a swamp or a sewer. You do still claim to be the ultimate gamer, right? From this point on, we're mostly locked into the scenes from the films, and realistically, you'd expect the next scene to just go straight to that lobby shootout. Instead, they've tried to flesh out Neo's journey in between that iconic moment. I mean, in the movie, it did kind of feel odd how Neo went from being a bit of a deer in the headlights to suddenly storming a building and effortlessly gunning down an entire platoon of SWAT with Trinity. 
Here though, it feels like that progression of his skills and abilities is handled a lot better because they can afford to spend an extra couple of hours showing him learning new things and advancing. There's that level where you're escaping the hotel when the agents ambush you, before then having to move through the sewers with Trinity, Switch, and APOC, fighting back against the SWAT and barely surviving an encounter with an agent. Then you get to that lobby shootout, at a point when you're probably pretty comfortable with your moveset and how everything works. So the level ends up being a good combination of a combat sandbox, but also still being somewhat challenging as you're dealing with this constant influx of enemies. It is a bit criminal that they don't have that propeller head song playing in the background, but yeah, look, I get it. Music licensing is a thing. Thankfully, with the magic of video editing, you can see what it might have been like. The next sequence on the rooftop definitely goes on far too long for its own good, I think. And it also introduces that backwards dodge move that Neo pulls off, which, as far as I can tell, is something that you never have to do for the remainder of the game. It's only used here to distract that agent long enough so Trinity can shoot him from the side. The agent! Shoot the agent! What I did think was kind of odd though was when they're recreating that scene from the film, instead of Trinity saying, dodge this, dodge this. For some reason, she says, we don't need this. We don't need this. And all I can say there is, why? I mean, why change one of the most iconic lines in the entire series? I mean, well, second most iconic line. Whoa. They do the same thing later on with the final showdown against Smith. Instead of him saying, we've missed you. We missed you. He says, I've been looking for you. I've been looking for you. I mean, of all the things to change, messing around with some of the more memorable lines of dialogue, that didn't seem like the kind of thing I'd go for, man. Next, he's gonna tell me that there is no fork. After this, there's another memorable moment captured in game, strafing alongside that skyscraper with a chopper minigun. And again, it's pretty cool seeing it recreated here. You get to level an entire building at one point, and also witness a crack. oh, fuck's sake. You get to level an entire building at one point, and also witness a crashing chopper demolish another. Awesome. What comes next is the showdown against Smith and Neo in the subway station, and you have to admit, this was pretty damn fun. Trying to get this asshole to stay on the track so the train hits him is a bit finicky. I mean, funnily enough, he doesn't just stand still and let himself be run over. But I was having so much fun during this stage anyway that it didn't even really bother me. About the only disappointment I had at this point was, again, the fact that it doesn't use the music from the films. Doesn't use any of Don Davis's orchestral music, and I mean, those tracks were really what part of what made these scenes so memorable. Without them, it just kind of falls flat. Incoming train. Please stay behind the white line. Now what comes after this is a great example of what I was saying earlier on, how the new content they've thrown in just kind of completely kills the momentum of this campaign. Remember in the movie how after defeating Smith, Neo got sucked into this weird glitched out area of the Matrix and took a ride on a subway carriage that was upside down. Then he had to fight a bunch more SWAT on a station platform before escaping on a flatbed train carriage. Yeah, me neither. Yeah, well that's what comes next, at a time when all you really want to do is get shot in the chest a bunch of times and come back to life completely enlightened. And I think the fight against Seraph later on is another good example of this too. That was definitely one of the better bits in Matrix Reloaded, but now instead of it just being a quick fight starting and ending in the tea house, after that first part you're then fighting on the top of these suspended wooden poles. It even keeps going after that when you're in a Chinese theater with a projection of the fight from the film playing in the background, while some neckbeard screams out these incredibly unfunny quips. Oh, hey, you're making me miss this scene! Not only is this annoying and just completely out of place, but combined with the projection of the movie across the screen and your character, it's also just disorienting. Whoa! Now that's cool! And then even after that, it's not over. You're back in the tea house fighting for one final phase. Give me a great big WTF! Now look, I understand that the fight scene in the film was like 60 seconds long. That wouldn't really be all that fun in a game if it was over so quickly, considering how easily you can stomp this guy. But if plan B is shit like this, well then guys, there has to be a plan C. Anyway, I'm getting sidetracked. Where was I? Oh yeah, the end of the first film. Right, so after beating the three agents and becoming the one, that's it. 
You can hang up that phone and start showing these people what the Matrix doesn't want them to see. The game ends and it goes to credits. Yeah, no, I'm kidding. Now you're starting these new missions where Neo's trying to rescue all these other red pill perspectives. You've got a librarian, an artist, a healer, security guard, and I guess some bitch who's really into underground rapes. Whatever. Intervening to rescue these people in their time of need. People that you never hear or see from for the rest of the game. But you may as well be rescuing a lava lamp or a beanbag because I'd give as much of a shit about those inanimate objects as I do these people. At least if they came up with missions showing how characters from the films got freed, well it would have been more interesting and helped to fill in those backstories. But it just feels like blatant filler where you're rescuing literal NPCs. And like I said, once they're saved, you never hear or see from them ever again. Not so much as a thank you, a Christmas card or a handjob, man how rude. No, no, this is impossible. I do think the one with the artist is pretty funny though, because before this guy joins you, it seems you have to beat him into submission first. And yeah, nothing persuades someone better than picking them up by their ankles and spinning them around like a fucking windmill. Yeah, still wanna take that blue pill now, you stupid bitch. The sequence after this though was probably one of my favorite levels in the game. And this is where you take on the upgraded agents from Matrix Reloaded, three at once. But at this point, I had the combos down pretty good and I just absolutely wrecked their shit. <clears throat> And I'll just put it out there, using agents as nunchucks is about as good as gaming is ever going to get. It again uses a similar concept to rescuing the red pills. Instead, now you've got to rescue the various captains from being attacked. Again, in the order you choose. Though at least these are characters we know and have a connection with, so there is some kind of element of importance to it. I'll stay with you. No, we need to prep the ship for departure. This point we're up to the Burly Brawl, another pretty memorable scene from the movie, at least up until Neo turned into gravity-defying rubber CGI man. But this leveling path of Neo has to be one of the worst things I've ever seen in a video game. I mean, you've got to admire their attempt at adapting this in the first place, but it really is just a bit of a disaster. In case you don't remember this scene, it's that one where Neo gets into a fight with like a bazillion Smiths, holding out for no apparent reason until he finally remembers he can fly, at which point he just yeets out of there like he's leaving the planet entirely. And this is the same concept in the game, you're going to be rushed by a whole bunch of these guys, only it's just a bit of an illusion, because you're not being attacked by this giant crowd at once, instead it's maybe like half a dozen or so, while the rest of them run circles around you like they're stampeding cattle. This effect just looks so bad, not to mention it breaks apart under any kind of observation, with the smiths clipping through walls and other solid objects. Yeah, I love the way too how they circle around Neo in this bit too, like they're scurrying ants or something. Makes me sick. Makes me sick! Throughout this fight too, the flow of the combat is constantly interrupted by some kind of cutscene which is trying to copy a shot from the film. And the entire point of this level is just to beat up as many of them as you can while you wait for Neo to finally bitch out and fly away. I have to go now. My planet needs me. It's a shame they couldn't find a way to shoehorn in a level set on the highway, so it instead jumps right ahead to what I think is the best fight scene in the second film inside the Merovingian Chateau. And again, this is a definite highlight of the whole campaign. It's kind of amazing how fun this game is when it just lets you fight people in an easy to navigate environment. I don't need any stupid gimmicks or objectives, just let me punch someone in the fucking face, is that too much to ask? And honestly, I would have been happy if the whole game was nothing but a series of fights against the characters from the movies back to back. You know, like a standard beat em up. Take one last breath of fresh air though, because from this point on, all hope is lost, and we enter what is probably the darkest hour. Taking on these entirely new series of levels, four in total, as you have to pass all of these tests set out by the Merovingian. The first of which sends you to this kind of weird Alice in Wonderland upside down world where you're fighting giant ants who know Kung Fu. Come again. Let me just repeat that right in case you think you misheard me because you didn't. Giant ants who know Kung Fu. Yeah, and they can only be killed by fire attacks or else they keep regenerating. If you ever want to know how stupid the Matrix could ever get, well, this is it right here, folks. And yeah, I get that it's playing on the whole Alice in Wonderland analogy from the first movie. I just don't think we needed an entire LSD trip of a level dedicated to it. This series of levels ends with one of the worst boss fights I think I've ever experienced in my 35 years alive in this timeline. Against a witch who throws trash around like she's Psycho Mantis and has a shield that stuns you, along with regenerating health to top it all off. 
There's also this weird NPC you keep coming across during these levels who looks suspiciously like Lana Wachowski. Bitch is going down! Too much, I think, for it just to be a coincidence. It almost made me wish I was back playing those horrible levels in Enter the Matrix where you've got to fight werewolves and kill them with wooden stakes. And man, did we take those levels for granted. I'm so sorry, Enter the Matrix. Maybe I judged you too harshly. The ludicrous nature of all of this new content really starts to make sense when you think about all of the dumb stuff they added into those sequels. I mean, things like rogue programs, which basically act like vampires, albino ghosts with dreadlocks, or a cake that gives a woman an orgasm. The last one I think being the most unlikely because we all know the female orgasm is a myth. Show me. This game's new content, and even that recent Matrix Resurrections, which was absolutely dreadful, really shows what happens, I think, when the Wachowskis get carte blanche when it comes to creating new content and ideas. Lucky me. And the ultimate proof of that is for the last part of the game, which jumps right ahead to the final, final showdown in Revolutions against Neo and Smith. Does make sense that they jump right to this scene, considering that not much else happened to Neo in that third movie, aside from him getting beaten up by a hobo. For some reason too, they chose to recreate that one scene where he loses his eyes and fights that literal nobody who got possessed by Smith. Honestly, I couldn't even tell you that character's name if you had a gun pointed at my testicles. Helpless. Pathetic. So it all comes to a head against the final showdown against Neo and Smith, which I have to admit, again, was one of the better moments in that third film. Especially visually, where it kind of looked like they were fighting in the midst of a cum storm. But again, this is kind of ruined, because every time you go near the edge of the arena, you've got to watch this cutscene of Neo being pushed back in by all these other Smiths. Worse still is that it does the same thing if even Smith goes near the edge. Every. Single. Time. Remember earlier on how I said that there's things in this game that I cannot believe made it into a so-called finished product. Well, stuff like this, this is it. Smith is also laughably easy because any of the combos you can pull off pretty much wipe out his entire health bar in like one or two attacks. It's definitely a lot more one-sided than that same sequence in the movie was, let me put it that way. But we're not done yet, Sonny Jim, because they saved the most infamous sequence until right at the end. Now, after beating Smith's ass like a Cherokee drum, at this point, everything comes to a stop. And then the Wachowskis show up as these pixelated characters, and in a final display of complete disregard for the player's time, they go on this bizarre rant about the game, about the player's progress, but more importantly, the final boss. Because for some reason, they thought this was necessary. Basically, the gist is that they're telling the player that they're replacing the ending of the film with something entirely unique. And I think that even if you've never played this game, you must have at least heard about this. Because what you end up doing is having a fight against a giant pile of trash in the shape of Agent Smith. But did they really need to spoil this? I mean, they basically just gave away the whole ending. It'll be like George Lucas popping up at the end of Empire Strikes Back and going, well, Hey guys, just so you know, Darth Vader's about to say that he's Luke's father. Come again. The Oran shock that we would have had taking on this sudden new threat when 99% of people would have assumed that the game was over has just been ruined completely. Yeah, what a perfect analogy for this game also. A giant piece of garbage wearing sunglasses. That basically sums up the entire Matrix franchise after the first film. As for the fight, well, it's actually pretty simple. You've either got to avoid an upward swipe by dodging left or right, or a sideward swipe by dodging up or down. If you get hit too many times, you get knocked back to this other area where you need to punch piles of trash. Again, another great analogy for the series. After dodging a few swipes, you can then charge into Garbage Smith and knock a piece of him off. The timing for this is kind of tricky, but once the whole thing clicks, the whole fight is just a test of patience, because this has to be done like a dozen times to actually beat him. Then the whole thing comes to an end as Queen's We Are The Champion starts playing over the end credits. I am dead fucking serious. You know what, it wouldn't surprise me if they just put this song in there to check if people were still paying attention. Because at this point the game's easily hit like the 10 to 12 hour mark. But more than that, all I could think of was they could somehow license a Queen song to use in the end credits, but they couldn't get Don Davis' music. That's impossible! Either way though, that's it. Path of Neo is done and dusted. You can now play around with all the various cheat codes you unlocked or go back and replay all levels. Though sadly, your powers don't carry over to any of these. Would have been pretty fun going back to the subway fight against Smith, for instance, and just stomping his face into the concrete like it was nothing. But I don't know, man. Chalk that one up to yet again more wasted potential. <laughs> You know what the craziest thing is, is that when it comes to Matrix games, Path of Neo is still about the best we've ever gotten, which really isn't saying a lot. 
I don't think we'll ever see a remake of this thing or even any kind of remaster, but it will live on as this odd little technological relic, a real product of its time and a monument to what was possible back then in that era of gaming. There's worse movie-based games out there and also far better ones, but I can say with absolute confidence, as far as video games based off Neo go, this is definitely one of the best. And it sure treats the character with far more respect than this recent reboot does.